guys, Geekonomics here, and as promised, here we are with the essay response to the practice paper which I put up just before the Easter holiday. I hope you've all had a go at it. Let's now have a look at it and consider some things which you may wish to include in your answer to this particular question. I think whatever the question for this particular extract and the essay question, a lot of the points which I'm going to talk about here, you'll be able to tweak slightly and include them in pretty much any essay which comes on this particular extract. So, reforms to the supply side of the economy are seen by some as to the key to promoting long-run economic growth in Zambia. Discuss. 20 marks. So again, remember we are trying to build through the levels in an essay. Level 1, level 2, level 3. Now remember, level 3 will only get you to 10 marks out of 20. And so your evaluation here is so important. Um, you've got to get a nice balanced discussion with a lovely conclusion to it based on the evidence. All nice and set out in a very coherent fashion. That will get you into the 18 to 20 marks out of 20. And the examiners are not told, don't give 20, so if it's worth 20, you'll get 20. Uh, so I wouldn't worry about that. Okay, so how would we go about tackling this one? So I think to start off with, as, as has been the case, and the, the, the sort of the formula for all of the other um, questions, start off with a few basics. So define long-run economic growth. Define what we mean by supply-side policies. And perhaps then give a basic explanation of supply-side policies, what, what it is that they're intended to do, improve productive capacity, shift AS right, shift PPC outwards, that type of thing. Give a basic explanation of what we mean by long-run economic growth, and again, it's pretty much the same thing, all to do with AS curve shifting rather than an AD. Having done that, I then think that you should get into figure 5.1 because you really need to set out the arguments as to why supply side policies are required given the current state of, uh, and the current I think it's quite a, you know, a terrible state in terms of the a aggregate demand component C plus I plus G plus X minus M and what's going on there which is all illustrated for you in figure 5.1. So I've said here, outlines the reasons why such reforms may be considered necessary with reference to figure 5.1. So, in the first paragraph of extract 5, we're told that average growth in Zambia has been 6% with inflation at 6.5%. Now, the growth rate is obviously very encouraging, but inflation, although it is lower, if you read your case study, it is lower than it has been in the past, 6.5% inflation is still very high. And one of the potential reasons for that, although we can't say that at this stage, but one of the potential reasons is because we've got too much short-run economic growth, which is AD shifting, and running into the bottlenecks uh, in the curve, on the long-run aggregate supply curve. And as a consequence of that, that is forcing prices upwards, that is forcing inflation upwards. Whereas, of course, if we could manage that more appropriately with a shift of AD in tandem with AS, that would be much more, as we say, sustainable economic growth. So, a few points from figure 5.1 to help in our explanation. We can see that there are significant levels of private consumption, equivalent to 87.2% in 2001, and falling to 57% in 2009. Now it has fallen, uh, granted, but it is still a significant contributor. If you look at the data in the final three columns, consumption, particularly private consumption, is a significant contributor to economic growth in 2010, 2011, 2012. So the end of the time series that we're given. So you may wish to uh, include reference to, for example, a consumer-led debt-fueled growth where AD is shifting rather than AD and AS shifting in tandem. So that would be short-run economic growth. You could talk about the fact that it narrows the negative output gap, but of course there's potential there to generate a positive output gap, which is of course inflationary, which links into this 
point here about the fact that we do have significant uh, inflation in the economy. Point two, the trade balance, the trade deficit, standing at 16.2% in 2001. And again, this, is a, this presents us with a similar scenario to consumption. It's an economy, it's painting a picture of an economy which is living beyond its means. Don't forget about the induced nature of imports. As national income rises, imports are induced. In other words, you tend to suck in more imports as the economy grows because people have more money to bring things in from abroad. Now, in some senses, that's a good... Hi guys, it's Economics here. This is part two of the um, answer to the essay with regard to the practice paper that I put out just before the Easter holiday. I uh, had a few camera issues, so hence uh, the change of uh, the change of wardrobe, as it may be, and the second part of this. Anyway, so in the previous section, in the first section which I did, I got up to this section here where we were talking about the trade position for Zambia, the trade deficit position, and I think I just finished off by saying that the trade deficit is not necessarily a problem because, of course, it is a sign of economic growth in an economy, and as an economy is growing, the population are getting wealthier and they tend then to suck in more imports from abroad. So it's not always a bad thing. However, countries such as our own and such as the United States, which do run uh, very significant, very sizable uh, current account deficits, it's not really an issue for us because, of course, we, uh, we're very creditworthy nations and we, can, we are able to attract the necessary funding into the financial account and the balance of payments in order to finance that. However, for Zambia, the situation is probably slightly different. And let's just consider one way in which a country like Zambia might actually be financing this current account deficit. Uh, if you then flip to the financial account of the balance of payments, one of the things that they may be doing and could do would be to sell foreign currency and their foreign exchange reserves in order to uh, raise the necessary capital to finance this current account deficit. Well, of course, we've already talked about the fact that Zambia has this foreign exchange constraint, a lack of foreign exchange in the economy, which makes it very difficult for the Zambians to bring in uh, imports from abroad. Well, if that is the case, any financing of a current account deficit by selling foreign exchange is obviously going to exacerbate that problem and make it worse. Secondly, countries like Zambia, they'll have to borrow probably from abroad and attract funds in from abroad, maybe selling debt or something like that in order to finance it. And again, that, um, that will incur an interest rate, that will, that's a borrowing cost, and as a consequence of that, that yet again, there's an opportunity cost issue there, because if you're financing that, you can't be putting money into the other areas, such as uh, you know the components of the Human Development Index necessary for development. So we're talking about health and education and so on. So I think that's, that's it really on uh, current account deficit, but do bear that in mind. Okay, next thing I've got here is Thirlwall's Law. Um, I think this is around about page 226 in the green OCR A2 textbook. You'll not find it in the index, but I think it's something worth mentioning here. So Thirlwall's Law is the rate of growth, now that's the rate of economic growth, which is consistent with a balance of payments equilibrium. So. It's calculated by an equation, which is the rate of growth of exports divided by the income elasticity of demand for imports. If you look to figure 5.1, you can see that the rate of growth of exports year on year is around about 6%. So we would have 6% on the top line. And then if you consider the income elasticity of demand for imports... Um, in Zambia, and obviously, if Zambia and if the nation or as the population as a whole get an increase in their income, then there'll probably be a more than proportionate increase in the demand for those imports. And so, consequently, the YED, the income elasticity of demand for imports, is likely to be quite elastic. So, if you say, let's just say it's two, for example, so your equation would be six over two. Obviously, that gives you an answer of 3. So Thirlwall's law then would say that a rate of economic growth of 3% is 
is consistent with balance of payments equilibrium. Well, look at your figure 7.1, look at the, sorry, 5.1, look at your, um, any of the paragraphs preceding that. They're all talking about growth rates between 6, 7, you know, 6, 7, 8%, something like that. And so clearly, uh, the, the rate of economic growth, particularly if it's very short run fueled, uh, you know, consumer debt fueled growth, this is not consistent with uh, a trade balance. And so this problem of the trade deficit will always persist unless the rate of growth is perhaps brought down slightly and um, ameliorated slightly. Next point. You can see again from figure 5.1 how much consumption is going on and investment, but particularly with regard to that which is spent by the government, so the public consumption and the public investment. But I think more importantly from the table and from figure 5.1 is that you can see that really public investment doesn't actually contribute that much to economic growth. Um, if you look at the column on the very far right hand side along the public investment section, you can see there's a lot of money going in, but its actual overall contribution to growth is fairly small. Now this could be for a number of reasons, of course, one of those reasons might be corruption in the economy. Another of the reasons might be, and always good to get these terms in, ex inefficiency um, to do with public sector investment or public sector organisations as a whole, um, sometimes referred to as organisational slack. And so any supply side policies which would be aimed at rebalancing the economy um, and sort of crowding in, nice phrase to get into an answer as opposed to crowding out, crowding in private sector investment which of course will be made on a commercial basis, therefore profit seeking, therefore much likely to be much more efficient, uh, that would obviously be highly desirable and much more likely to make a more significant contribution to economic growth. I mean it talks doesn't it in paragraph 2 on extract 5 about the fact that there has been this shift away from public to private but then as you look to the years 2010, 2011, 2012 the shift is back again towards more public sector which is obviously uh, not a good thing in that, in that respect. And you may also wish to mention there the Harrod Domar growth model where of course we're talking about private sector investment again and that may improve this overall capital output ratio that Harrod Domar refers to and so um, you need you know it's more efficient in terms of the amount of capital going in relative to the amount of output it produces. So I think these are the areas and the reasons why reform is needed. All of this really is <coughs> excuse me talking about AD shifting to the right on a diagram, it's talking about short run growth, it's talking about inflationary bubbles building in the economy, it's talking about trade problems persisting in the economy. And so you can then, obviously, point six here, you could then go on to say, well, actually, these supply side reforms would be necessary and highly desirable because they would then shift AD, but also shift AS in tandem and we know, of course, ladies and gentlemen, that is sustainable economic growth. Always a good phrase to get into uh, your exam. I remember Susan Grant at the examiner's meeting, she always loves to hear about sustainable economic growth. And so diagram, you could get diagram, diagrams in here. I'm not going to draw those, but I'm sure you know the ones I'm talking about. And so then after that, you then obviously come to the discussion part of this. And you then need to say... Yeah, this is all very well, but here are some reasons why, even with these supply-side reforms, the long-run economic prosperity of Zambia may not be in safe hands. And so let me just move this on and we'll talk about that. So here I've got six or seven different reasons why, in spite of these supply-side proposals, it may not be beneficial and the Zambian economy may still uh, struggle. Number one, it talks about there being a lack of adequate transport infrastructure. And so no matter whether you uh, cure the access to credit um, or any of the supply side uh, proposals which are, pro which are proposed, um, it may still be difficult for the economy to grow when infrastructure is not uh, in place. 
Um, if you've watched my video with Mr. Bourne, a colleague of mine who worked in Zambia for four or five years, one of the things he talked about was um, infrastructure in the energy industry and the fact that electricity would just, just like that, just like that, would all of a sudden go out in districts. And so, you know, you can't, you cannot, number one, you can't run businesses like that. Number two, how on earth are you going to attract foreign direct investment into an economy which uh, is struggling with that type of problem? Secondly, we're told, I think it's the penultimate paragraph of figure 5.2 about, you know, if you sum total all of the investment into the mining industry, it's going to be more than 5 billion. But let's not forget about the footloose nature of the multinational companies. Let's not talk about the fact that, okay, mining might go okay, but what happens when the mining starts to decline, when the demand for copper starts to decline? There's a need to rebalance the economy in Zambia. The Dutch disease, you'll remember I've referred to it as previously. Talk about time and expense, the obvious sort of uh, issues for um, supply-side policies. Point 11 here, maybe a useful to use and in tandem with and in conjunction with uh, demand management and supply side policies, what about expenditure switching policies such as monetary policy? So we could increase, for example, uh, we could increase the, or decrease, it depends on, on what you wish to happen, let's just think about this, in order to help support the expansion of the manufacturing base. So we would want, therefore, what would we want, ladies and gentlemen? We want to bring in fewer goods from abroad. We want imports to be more expensive. So in that case, obviously, you'd want a base rate reduction, which would turn lead to a reduction in the value of the Zambian kwacha. And therefore, perhaps you would get more people buying domestic goods rather than foreign goods. And this is this whole infant industry argument. What do you do with a little baby infant? What do you do with a little child? You, as the adult, you protect said child. And in the same way, this is a method of switching consumption from external to internal. And it's a method of putting a little arm around, a little shield around the, the infant industries in Zambia, allowing them to grow and to flourish. And then you could maybe take away this uh, protectionist measure from them. Number 12. Regulation and licensing is prohibitive. Now, Joseph Stiglitz talks in his book, he talks about the race to the bottom. So in other words, he talks about the fact that um, foreign direct investment generally goes to places where regulations are the lowest, where costs are cheapest, and really where large multinationals can get away with the most that they can get away with. Now, a country like Zambia, which is in need of the FDI, but has very um, prohibitive regulation and licensing, that is obviously going to deter foreign direct investment. And so, in terms of the race to the bottom, Zambia is not going to be a top destination in that respect. Thirteen, uh, depleting resources for future generations. So, obviously, um, whenever, <coughs> excuse me, whenever there is all of this FDI going in and stripping out all of these assets in terms of the mining assets, um, you know, it's not really sustainable in that respect because the companies won't care what they leave behind. And so if they leave nothing behind, what, they're, what is there for the future? And then finally, it talks in your, I think it's the final paragraph of figure 5.2, it talks about the fact that there are these enterprise zones. And within these enterprise zones, this will obviously attract firms and businesses in, but this will aggravate regional inequalities and the distribution of income and wealth. And you may wish to refer to, ladies and gentlemen, the Lorenz curve, which talks about and discusses this whole notion of the distribution of income and wealth. And so, you know, that, that might therefore require some sort of fiscal policy intervention in order to redistribute incomes. So supply side policies on their own are not sufficient to cure the problems of the Zambian economy. I think that's what we, we would be concluding. And so obviously at the end of this, in order to get into the 18, 19, 20 out of 20, we need a paragraph or two which just outlines these, uh, these thoughts. Remember, it's, it's, based on, it's based on fact rather than your opinion. 
and just expressing these, these issues with regard to the fact that yes, supply side policies are necessary, yes, we know that demand, aggregate demand is, is moving and is moving in the right direction, but we need to we need to use other policies such as fiscal, you know, I've mentioned monetary policy here, I've mentioned fiscal policy here. We've mentioned expenditure switching policies here. There are all sorts of other policies which, as a whole basket of policies, might help to solve things. But supply side policies, potentially on their own, are not the answer. Okay, so I'm going to leave it at that, ladies and gentlemen. I will be back in the next thing next week. What I will do is I will put up what I think will now be the likely, the very likely final paper. Uh, for this F585 paper, so uh, keep watching, keep subscribing, and I hope the revision is going well. If you have any questions, uh, do, uh, do send me a message and I'll do my very best to get back to you. Bye for now.